how does math, pure math, generate matter? And this was first first acknowledged by Alexander Vilenkin. He said in the very last page of his book, Many Worlds in One, he says, uh, before there was matter, space, time, and energy, what could these fundamental laws of physics, what tablet could they have been written on? Um, in our experience, math is conceptual. It comes from a mind. In, and he then said, are we then really saying that there was a mind that predates the universe? Problem one, in, physic, in philosophy of physics, this is called the reification of math, treating math as if it has ca the causal powers to produce actual matter, space, time, and energy. In our experience, math doesn't have that power. It's something we use to describe matter, space, time, and energy. It doesn't produce any of those entities. The second problem was that in order to get that universal wave function that might include a universe like ours, a prior big hairy equation, a functional differential equation called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation has to be solved. But there's an infinite number of possible solutions to that equation unless the physicists themselves fix very specific boundary constraints on the equation. Now, in ordinary physics, an equation like that would get information about the boundary constraints from the physical system being described. If it was, for example, a, a, a string fixed between uh, two walls, you know, an oscill a, a, a string oscillator or something, you, the, the boundary constraints would be determined by the, the phys physical system you're going to describe. But before there's matter, space, time, and energy, before there's a universe, there's no physical system to give you information about how to fix those boundaries. So where do they come from? Well, it turns out that the physicists, the theoretical physicists, the quantum cosmologists chose those, those boundary constraints in order to get an outcome that they wanted, which was a universal wave function, which would include a universe like ours. In other words, it was a teleological, end-directed mathematical modeling where there was an input of information into the mathematical apparatus in order to achieve an outcome. Now, that's nothing more than, that's just modeling the need for a mind to generate a universe like ours. It's a form of, uh, of intelligent design. I think it lends plausibility to the idea that there needed to be a pre-existing mind. So even the quantum cosmological approach has, in, I argue, has theistic implications, which is odd Brian. because it was proposed yeah. by very ardent scientific <laughs> atheists, including Lawrence Krauss. In interesting, right. Brian, th thoughts on all of that? Yeah, so I, I have to push back with respect on Steve in that these uh, theories of inflation were never posited uh, to either provide a uh, non-theistic or materialistic origin of the universe. They were posited, in effect, to explain certain features of the universe uh, that were uh, thought to be necessary, perhaps uh, demanded to be uh, to be uh, you know conditioned uh, for the existence of life, but not necessary to obviate or to eliminate the need of a creator the way that the quasi steady state universe was although there were sort of philosophical categorical classes that they do share in common uh, whereas the anthropic principle and, and retorts to them they were percolating around the same milieu in the 70s and 80s when particle cosmology came about for example no one i don't think anyone would say that um, the absence of magnetic monopoles uh, that would really be, you know, a kind of a, a tick in the box for God. You know, God could really hang his hat <laughs> on on the absence of magnetic monopoles. And that was one of the prime motivations for Alan Guth, the young postdoc struggling to find a job. Uh, we can all relate to that in the late 1970s, um, uh, dealing with inflation of a different kind uh, back then and, uh, and, and, and obtaining this great position at MIT where he remains to this day. Uh, and yet it turned out that this solution that he found would later have to be solved by another colleague at Stanford University by the name of Andre Linde operating under a completely different set of constraints in the uh, in the former Soviet Union uh, to understand the properties of phase transitions. And it was found that in order to uh, in order to explain the the properties that were wrong, that were known to be wrong with the initial inflationary universe, and this is something, I, Justin, I don't know if most of the lay people in the audience might appreciate. Typically, what we in cosmology and most scientists do is we don't solve a problem. We just correct a whole host of problems that existed in a previous problem. And I always tell my graduate students when they come to me and they say, you know, they say, Brian, I solved this great problem. I say, Mazel tov. You just earned your ticket to an even harder problem because uh, you just picked the lowest fruit, you know, and, and now you got the next one up uh, because that's what we do. Uh, Newton was right 
uh, and he found the law of universal gravitation uh, and he paved the way for Einstein. Well, Einstein isn't the final word uh, and we, we now know about the properties of atoms. Well, Bohr was right. He won a Nobel Prize for this model of the atom that we know to be completely wrong, but it had certain properties that were correct. Those were updated and corrected by Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and the Born in the Quantum Revolution. So too with inflation. Now, the difference with inflation is that it might not be possible, even in principle, to prove it wrong, let alone to be proven, proving it right, because of the fact that concomitant with inflation, because of the apparatus that's been uh, built on to correct its lacuna, uh, is this notion of the multiverse. It's almost impossible to find a model of inflation that predicts the beautiful patterns in the microwave background. So now we can play God and I can bring in a universe and we can look at the universe here as a, as a deity would. And we can see these finely tuned structures, these fluctuations and, that would later become the, clusters. For the benefit of those who are listening on the podcast or, or radio, you're, you're holding a, a, a sort of 3D image of the background microwave radiation here. Um, so just yes. explain, yeah, what, what, what? Yes, it's a, it's a beach very ball. colorful and beautiful, right? Yeah, yes, it's a beach ball made by my friends at NASA, uh, rendering the image of the tiny fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background that are far smaller than the fluctuations in this real beach ball compared to its size. These are at the part uh, in ten to the fourth. Uh, fluctuations. They're smaller than the height of Mount Everest compared to the height of the Earth. These are incredibly tiny fluctuations. So just think from space, you see pictures of the Earth. You can't see the height of Mount Everest compared to the smooth globe, globular structure of the Earth. Anyway, those structures are, per, are consequences of inflation. But what inflation leaves out is how did it itself get started? And that's where the multiverse comes in. And Stephen's exactly right. What Hawking and others tried to do is graft onto a theory of cosmic structure, a cosmological kinematic theory. They tried to graft on a theory of cosmogenesis, of cosmogony. And that is something it was never designed to do. And I feel that this is causing us a great deal of, of, of challenge in cosmology not only because of theistic overtones, but because it's simply overextending what it's designed to do. And, and, and so it will never be able to provide a adequate answer to how did it itself get sparked? How did the spark that ignited the Big Bang, as I call inflation, how did that it itself get in, ignited? That is a question that inflation itself can't answer. And the more that the Krauses and the, um, and, 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 and the Glindays try to explain it, I think it's, uh, it'll prove to be almost impossible to wriggle out of. Uh, Justin, I'm real sympathetic to what Brian has just said. One point of clarification is that um, my critique of the Hawking, Krauss, um, uh, Valenkin approach is not that it's necessarily wrong, but that even if it's right, it has theistic implications. And I'm not, I'm not uh, claiming that uh, inflation was generated as an anti-theistic argument. I think it was a very good theory to try to explain the, uh, the flatness problem, the problem, the homogeneity issue. Uh, so um, inflation, but one of the interesting things about inflation, which Bord, Guth, and Valenkin showed with their famous theorem, um, is that even if we, even if inflation is right, there's still a beginning, and you don't get around the beginning problem. And I think that's what Brian is just saying. That uh, uh, and and with the beginning, there's the the question of ultimate causation, which I don't think is solved within any materialistic framework. And quantum cosmology was super interesting to me because it presented itself as a framework by which you might be able to explain ultimate origins materialistically, but instead what it did was it explained it mathematically. And prior to that, in, in the mathematical apparatus, there was even the need for an intelligent input in the modeling. And so if true, then clearly I think this is, at, at best, I think you get a, a sort of platonic idealism out of quantum cosmology because you need conceptual realities to produce the matter. You need math to produce the matter. But if you have to also manipulate the math to get the outcome you want, then what you're really modeling is the need for intelligent design.